Welcome to the first uranium-led uh, workshop that we've done for a long time. So for those who I haven't met before, uh, my name is uh, Vince Paul. I'm the iLight manager. Um, I've been working on iLight uh, since 2009, so more than 10 years now. Um, the other, uh, and I'll be presenting um, the first half of today's webinar. Uh, and Joe Petrus, who's our lead developer, um, it will be presenting the second half of the uh, webinar on the more advanced uranium-led features like Visual Age and You Combine. Um, uh, as I mentioned in the emails, if you want to follow along, um, you need to download the example data set. Uh, so we will be going through um, at a pace, hopefully, that you can follow along with, uh, demonstrating how to do, uh, to start off with, just a basic uranium-led um, zircon example data set. And then Joe will start showing some of the really cool features that we've got like um, Visual Age and UCPB. Uh, also, uh, hopefully you've downloaded the latest version of iLight version 4.3.4. In the email, I did say 4.3.3, but uh, there was a bug in that one. So we put out a, a super fast release. So 4.3.4 is the version you need. If you don't have that, you may see some, some errors, but it's, it's not the end of the world. Uh, if we do go too quick for you, uh, don't worry. Uh, we're recording it so you can go back and um, rewatch it later on. Um, and I do have to point out that this is just going to be a, you know, a couple of hours showing how to do things in iLight. Normally, when you learn how to do uranium-led dating, uh, there's a lot more that goes into it, like understanding the uncertainties and understanding um, all the processes and getting the best data. We'll just be showing how to do that in iLight, but there's a lot more in it. And normally we'd recommend um, the two-day workshops that are quite often run by the uranium-led community. So without much more further ado, um, let's get started. Oh, so just before I get started, if you do need any help, uh, there is documentation at ilight.xyz forward slash docs. Um, and uh, there is some more information, uh, general information on our FAQ page. Um, I do recommend using the forum because then everyone, well, one, you can get an answer very quickly if you go there and someone who's already asked the exact same question. Uh, but also if you um, do get a response from us, it'll allow everyone to see um, what the answer was. Also, there's the notes, which is the iLight blog. Uh, it's still new, the iLight 4 blog, um, but we'll be posting on there regularly, especially now that iLight's starting to become a bit more mature and we're not working on, you know, the real fundamentals. We've got a bit more time to work on the documentation and uh, putting up blog posts on individual topics that, uh, that we want to go into a bit more detail in. It's not, really, um, uh, it's not really appropriate to put those in the documentation. So... Just so that you know, we won't be covering any of the really basics in this um, webinar. Um, we're expecting that you'll be familiar with the basics that we covered in the previous webinar. Um, so hopefully you all know how to do these things listed here. Uh, so in this, we'll be covering, as I said, a very brief introduction of uranium-led geochronology, uh, the basic concepts, and I will keep them very basic. So please don't use this as a, as a reference. It's just, just the basics, just enough to cover what we'll be covering today. Um, we'll be doing a typical zircon uranium lead data set. Uh, then we'll be looking at some of the, uh, the export options. Uh, then we'll be switching and Joe will be talking about the Visual Age plugin, which is where you really start to get to some cool live Concordia and some extra additional calculations. Uh, and also the, one of the most commonly requested features that we had when we moved to iLight 4 was everyone saying, when is UCP, UCP, everyone was calling it, UCombine, uh, going to be available? Uh, that's now available, um, and we'll be giving a quick demonstration of that today as well. And we'll also be talking about error propagation, because that's another one we get a lot of questions about. So let's get started with the basics. So as I said, the super basics are that, you know, it's, this is most often done on zircons, uh, because they're very common access accessory minerals. Uh, when they form, they only incorporate uranium into the crystal lattice. So any lead that's there is from radioactive decay. Uh, uranium-238 decays to lead-206 and 235 decays to um, lead-207. And we can use the uranium-lead ages to determine the age of the formation of zircon. 
But there are some facts that miss, mess up this, these super basic concepts. And the most uh, commonly known are that lead may come from other sources, uh, or we may lose lead due to uh, subsequent processes. But the ones that we'll be looking at today um, and that, that iLight can help you with are the analytical issues, and in particular, downhole fractionation. So what is downhole fractionation? Well, more formally, it's downhole elemental fractionation. Um, it's, if you look at a typical spot, you can see where the laser switch is on, we have the signal increases quickly, we have uranium decreasing as the pit gets deeper, and then the laser switches off, and lead does the same thing. It increases quickly when the laser switches on, decreases steadily as the pit gets deeper, and then drops away when the laser switches off. But the problem is, is that over that time, the ratio between lead to uranium doesn't remain constant. In fact, it evolves um, due to processes happening as the pit is, uh, is, is um, ablated. Now, uh, sometimes we get lost in the details um, of improving our, our accuracy for uranium lead dating, but uh, we quite often forget that this, this effect here is probably the, the largest effect on uranium lead by laser ablation um, dating. Uh, this effect can be 20% or more, depending on your cell. Um, and so correcting for it will be, if, if you do a poor job of correcting for it, you will probably, do, you will probably get poor results. So uh, ILA gives you as many, possible, uh, uh, as many possibilities um, for correcting it as, as we can. So there's different uh, approaches to this downhole correction. Uh, the first uh, approaches in the early days was to basically fit a line to the downhole um, pattern of fractionation and then uh, project that back to time zero, which would be this intercept here. And then you have uh, a set uh, ratio, which is not affected by downhole fractionation. The problem with this, however, is that you get just one result for your entire ablation and you lose all of your time resolution. Another way to go about it is that you fit a line to your downhole fractionation, and then you use this line to, uh, uh, to correct for this trend. So you end up with this nice flat uh, relationship in which uh, there is no longer any effect from downhole fractionation, and any of the variation that you see in this is variation that is occurring within your um, zircons. So as I said, uh, I like gives you several options for doing this, uh, this correction. Um, so you know, it, when it was originally written for the laser in our lab, we had an exponential um, relationship, and, uh, but there's many others. Uh, in all cases, it uses the average pattern uh, for, for your reference materials, your primary reference materials. So you can see in this image over here, what ILAT has done is it's taken all of your reference materials, your primary reference materials, um, each ablation, and it's lined them up so that they all start at the same time. And then for every time period, it's created, it's calculated the average, and that's what this red line is here. And then it'll apply a model to that, and that's the model that will be used to correct your data. And as I mentioned, this has the effect of maintaining this time resolution because you know, laser ablation, the whole point of laser ablation is that time is actually a proxy for position. And that might be different positions within zones of your zircons or whatever mineral you're, you're measuring. Uh, it is important to note that this downhole correction is just the first step in the process. It just flattens the data. Uh, it is still at that point offset from true. And then we normalize it to the known uranium lead ratio of the reference material. So that's how we go from the downhole correction to the, to the final ratio. So this is just looking at the 206, 238 ratios, but you do the downhole correction and then there'll be another result after that, which is where it's normalized to the reference material and that will be the final ratio. We do provide ages at each of these steps, but uh, they are just there as indicative ages, just for you to get a feel for what the ages might be. But we do normally recommend that you take your ages and put them into um, a program like Isoplot. The exact same thing happens for 207 and 235 and for 208, 232, if you've measured those. 
Um, so this is just an example of why you want to keep the time resolution of your data. So you can see here's some zircons, and this is actually uh, from the example data set we'll be looking at today. And you can see that there is a lot of internal structure within your zircons that you don't want to just, you don't necessarily just want to average out. Uh, sometimes that structure is geological, sometimes it's from um, uh, analytical, but you do want to keep that so that you're not just averaging everything out uh, and getting just one very large uncertainty. So to do the downhole fractionation correction, we do need one important piece of information, which is the hole depth, but we don't actually ever measure the hole depth. So we have to use a proxy and we use that, we use time as a proxy for, for hole depth. And to do this, we have to assume that the laser draw rate is constant for all analyses within a session. So for example, if we measure uh, our standards for 30 seconds and our samples for 30 seconds, we assume that the pit depth is the same and that we can use time as a proxy for depth within that um, 30 seconds. We, you know, I like we call this beam seconds. So it's just the time, the amount of time that the beam has on, been on. And uh, when we do this, we can, uh, it means that we can look at different uh, analyses in the exact same way. And we don't have to use all of our analysis because we now have this proxy for depth. So if the first part of the analysis is uh, affected by say surface contamination on top of your samples, uh, we can ignore that uh, because we have this relationship between um, beam seconds and our ratios. But it is critical that we do calculate beam seconds correctly. So uh, there are different methods for calculating beam seconds. Um, and you can choose them using the beam seconds method in the DRS settings, which we'll come to in uh, when we do the demonstration. Uh, before laser log files were around, uh, we had to do this by looking at when the uranium-238 uh, signal suddenly increased. Um, so this was called the rate of change method. So when the laser switches on, the uranium-238 uh, quickly increases. We look at the gradient of that and when it's positive uh, of by a certain amount, then we say, oh, the beam must have switched on, so let's start counting beam seconds. But there are times when you'll have uh, lower uranium um, concentration uh, zircons or um, minerals, and so sometimes those laser on events might not be sufficient to trigger this beam seconds on um, uh, event, and so it'll miss those zircons with low um, uranium, so it won't notice that 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 it's the laser switched on. We can also set a threshold value so that any time uranium moves up through uh, past this value, it'll set the beam seconds to start. It'll start on, uh, and this is a little bit more foolproof than doing the gradient method, the uh, rate of change method, um, but it does require a fair bit of fiddling with. But in all cases, it's almost always best to use the laser log file if you have one. Um, if you don't have one, or if you don't know how to create laser log files from your particular laser system, check out the documentation at iolite.xyz forward slash docs. Um, the laser instrument manufacturers have given us um, instructions on how to um, produce laser log files there. Uh, we don't have all the lasers, all the different types of lasers in our lab, so we have to rely on them to provide us with information. But laser log files, best way to go. So just to give you a feel for when beam seconds looks right, and my apologies in advance for using uh, red and green for all those people who are red, green, colorblind. I'm actually one of them, but I, I can make this out. Um, in green here, we have our uranium, uh, con our uranium counts. Um, this is 238 counts, and in red we have the beam seconds uh, counting up uh, each time. So you can see that when the, the signal switches on, uh, so when the laser switches on, you can see beam seconds starts to increase steadily until the laser switches off and it drops back to zero. And then it sits at zero until the next explosion starts and it goes up again and then drops back down again. And what you get is you get this nice regular height for beam seconds. And it's a nice sawtooth pattern. You don't see any jagged ups and downs. 
you do see some bigger gaps where, the, where there are bigger gaps between the analyses um, in this case. Uh, that was just um, different drive times between the different zircons, but it's a nice regular sawtooth pattern. Uh, and when you see, uh, when you look at it, when you run the DRS, you'll see that all your selections are nicely aligned at the start and that you have good coverage of data um, throughout this whole, this whole area. So in the background here, these colors that you can see and the, the you know, sort of spiky noisiness, that's the results for each individual uh, selection of our primary reference material. In this case, we're using Zircon 91500. So you can see that all of them um, are sort of stacked up. You can't see any individual ones, um, which is a good sign that none are standing out particularly. And that forms our body of data that gives us this red line, which is our average. And then in this case, we've fitted this black line through that. In contrast, here's what it looks like when beam seconds goes bad. So this time we have in green, and apologies again for the colors, uh, in green, we have uh, the uranium counts. Uh, so you can see the same analysis switching on and off. But this time in blue, we have beam seconds and we're using um, a rate of change method this time. And you can see that here in this region here, the concentration of uranium, uranium in these grains was too small for the gradient method to pick up. And so it just switches on here and keeps going until it sees this, this, uh, this event here and then switches back to this. So you can see in these, the, saw, the, the peak heights for beam seconds is all over the place, different heights. Um, in this case, we probably want them all to be this height along here, but you can see this one here is longer. Um, and so this is, this is when beam seconds is not working, but you might not notice that unless you plot this, and I do recommend plotting um, either uranium uh, 238 and beam seconds at the same time, or at least total beam and beam seconds. Uh, but this is what it'll look like when you run the DRS. So here you can see uh, this selection of our, this, this first selection of our reference material is here, starting at zero beam seconds, but these ones all start at about 50 beam seconds, which suggests that there was another analysis beforehand that we can't see here. And these other ones are starting all over the place. So if you see something like this, where beam seconds extends way out past, past the longest analysis that you've measured, you know, all of these were, um, were less than 50 seconds long, so they should all be in this region here. If you see this, this suggests that there is something wrong with your beam seconds method, and you should go and um, change the method that you're using. So this, if you see something like this, this is a very strong indicator that something is wrong. So after the downhole fractionation correction, we do normalize the reference material to get the final ratios. And these ratios do give you a sort of first pass age. Uh, but we, as I said earlier, we do recommend that you uh, export these ratios to isoplot to actually get proper full age calculations and uncertainties. So just in summary, uh, here's the different steps that happen when you run the DRS. So there's a baseline subtraction, and that gives you the channels with the under something underscore CPS. So for example, uranium 23S means it's the uranium channel after it's been baseline um, corrected. So it's the uranium 238 channel after it's been baseline corrected. Then we do a raw ratio calculation. So that will look like something like lead 206 to uranium 238. Then we'll do a downhole correction. The DRS does a downhole correction. And that will look like this. It'll have a DC and then the ratio. And then we have the final, final normalized ratio. And that will be, that will have a final um, before the ratio. And as I said earlier, there are, there are ages calculated at for steps two, three, and four. So let's start a worked example. Um, this is, just a simple uh, zircon data set. It's one from our lab that I think one of our students did. Um, for those who are granite uh, people, this is from a granite uh, just near Melbourne. Um, and it, this particular file is an Agilent file. Uh, it does need this date format. So it's the day, month, year. It's an hour with one H, not two H's. Um, and we'll import those data now. So I'll just switch to 
iLight. So when you start iLight, you should see the little welcome window that has recent um, experiments, recent sessions and recent templates. Um, just click the new button in the, uh, res uh, in the session side to start a new session and it'll have a nice uh, empty uh, window like this for you. So to import the file, we're gonna click and hold the import button and we're going to enter this uh, into this date time stamp here. So it's the first one in the list, but it's just with uh, one of the H's um, removed. Oops. So once you've entered that, we're gonna click save and import. And we're gonna open that file uh, in the example data set that we sent you. And this is the draw for Dot csv file this is the agilent um, this is the file from the agilent csv file and when it's loaded it will say one or more of the imported channels does not have a dwell time um, associated with it that's because this is an agilent csv file um, we're not going to be calculating lod's so we can just click no uh, we're not going to worry about dwell times in this uh, in this for, for uranium lead for the rest of the webinar so once you've loaded that, uh, you should see that it started around 2018-07-31. And if you go to the time series and you show uranium-238, it should look something like this. Let me make that dark blue so it's a little easier to see. Okay, so hopefully everyone can load those data. If you can't, just make sure you raise your hand. Um, now we'll load the log file. So there's a laser log file that goes with this, makes it much easier. Uh, so this is the draw for underscore log and then some numbers.csv file in the example data set. And we'll open that. And you should see something that looks like this. This is the sync window. Uh, if you don't have auto sync on, make sure you click this little auto sync and it should automatically align the two data sets. And you should end up with the laser offset reading of about minus 77 seconds. Normally we would zoom in on the start using the scroll wheel just to make sure that, uh, that it has linked up with the, the first analyses and it's not offset by one. Uh, and zoom in on the, the last as well. But if you've got an offset of minus 77, then I'm reasonably confident that you'll, you'll be fine. So now we have our, our data, mass spec data loaded and our laser log file loaded. And Let's see, let's see my way here. Um, when you go to the samples browser, we've just got one sample from our Agilent file, but we have all these samples from our, uh, from our laser log file. So we're gonna add, so in, in the experiment, we had 91500 as our primary reference material. And we also had a smattering of Tamora 2 and Plezoviches um, through there. And most of the unknowns, so all the unknowns, um, have DRO4 in their name. So we'll add the 91500s by typing in 91500. Essentially, just type 91 up the top in this search field up here. And that will uh, filter the list to only samples with 91500 in them. I'm going to select all of them by clicking on one, doing Command A or Control A on PC on Windows. And then I click on this Create Selection from Sample button. Uh, it's automatically picked that I want to put these into Z91500. I'm going to put in a start crop of one at the start and one at the end. Uh, and then click OK. Now I'm going to repeat that process for Plesvice. The exact same thing, I just type PL in the filter up here, selected all the samples here, and then create selections. This will automatically pick that I want to put this into the Plesvice uh, group. Uh, it's going to, I'm going to use the same crops as last time. Click OK. And I'm going to do the same thing with Tamora. Add all of those. Again, it's picked which one I want to put it in. And then we'll do that with the Dro samples. This is from Dramana, from anyone who's familiar with Melbourne. Um, and so I'm going to select all of those. This time it won't pick what group I want to put them in. So I'll just write draw into this field here and use the same crops. 
So now by this stage, you should have 91500 Plesovich A Tamora and Dro selected. We're just going to um, uh, now select some baselines. So we're going to do that using uh, channel data. So we'll go to tools, automatic selections from channels. And we're going to use the criteria total beam is less than 1000 counts. So we'll add a criterion. Uh, we're going to say less than, and we're going to say 10, sorry, 1000 counts. And if we were to show total beam here, and we select all those, we'll just pull this up a smidge, and they are all on the bottom there. It's a little hard to see, but I've tested this. So, um, and we'll, we'll check them in the main window in just a sec as well. So we're going to add the baselines. Uh, we're going to make a baselines group. So we're going to click, type in baselines here. It can be any name, but baselines is easy to remember if you spell it correctly. And we just have to make sure that we check this button here that says that tells I like that this is our baselines. All the rest can be left blank. Then we'll click add selections and we'll close that. And now when we go to the main window, the main time series view, you can see we have our selections. That's kind of the long way of doing it. Uh, the shorter way of doing it would have just been to click on this auto selections button and so let me select all of these again and click, oh actually I've got to get rid of the filtering. So with everything selected, I could have just clicked this here uh, and just use these settings and it would have done all of that for us in less than a second or including clicking time, about five seconds. But we've done it the, uh, the manual way and you can see our selections uh, are down here. Um, and we've got our 91500s that are lower in uranium uh, along the bottom here and the Plesoviches, now Tamoras, now Dros. Germanas, they that sense for. Um, we could here open the uh, the hover stats, and when we do that for uh, uranium, for when clicking on tomorrow two, we can see that one of our analyses has zero uh, zero uranium two three eight counts. So that was obviously just a miss or something like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to double click on that one which will zoom the main window to that. And you can see, yep, that's a miss. And we're going to delete that. So we're gonna click on the main window in the background and hit delete. And that will get rid of that for us. This window doesn't update automatically until we click to another um, group and then come back. And now you can see that we've got rid of that selection. So now we've got all our selections in place and you'll notice that I haven't done any uh, I haven't tried to trim any of the selections at all. I haven't um, uh, gone through any of the selections in detail because we tend to do that after we've done everything else. So at the moment, looking at some of these um, uh, and looking at raw counts uh, is less useful than looking at uh, ratios. So with this amount of information, we can start to run the DRS. So we'll go to the DRS and we'll click on uranium the geochronology. So I'm just going to flick back to the presentation just to give you some overviews of what these settings are. So um, we've done all those things. And as I mentioned, you could have just used the auto selections button with these settings and could have done everything at once for us. So it should look something like this uh, when you look at uranium 238. Uh, and we did delete that second tomorrow to ablation because it, it must have been a miss. So here are the uranium lead geochronology DRS settings. Uh, the top one up here is just the index channel. This is what is used for the beam seconds if you're using anything other than the laser log for the method. Um, otherwise, in uranium lead geochronology, it doesn't have as much impact um, as it does for, say, trace elements. This is the primary reference material that we're using. So this is what we're using for the downhole correction and for the uh, the normalization step to correct for the elemental um, bias. Uh, this is where we can set the default fit time. So that model that we saw to fit the, our observed downhole fractionation, um, we can uh, set 
our, what we think it will be before we start off. But when we're actually looking at the ratios, we can um, set that individually. So this is just what it'll start with. Uh, here we have the method for uh, the beam seconds calculation, as I mentioned. Uh, in this case, we're going to use the laser log and we recommend using the laser log whenever you can. This masking method, uh, this, these settings here are related to masking. So masking is where we want to hide the baseline data because in the baselines, if you take the ratio of zero to one or, or, uh, or some baseline values, one to the other, you're going to get crazy ratios. They're going to go everywhere between infinity and, um, and uh, not defined. And that really messes up with trying to view your data because, um, because all that noise uh, is impacting on the amount of scale that you can see in your, in your plots. So we actually mask that. And again, almost always the best method is just to use the laser log file. Um, you can use the same thing about using um, thresholds and those sorts of things. Uh, this is the trim. This is the amount of seconds to trim off bef uh, after it goes through a mask uh, on event and before a mask off event. Uh, generally, you want to keep this at zero, um, but if you increase this number, it'll start to push in from the sides of your selection and start masking um, from the sides or from, from when the, the mask switches on and off. Uh, again, we recommend defaulting that to zero, but uh, you can play with that um, and, and see what it does. Uh, down here, we have the sort of more advanced parameters like the, um, the uranium uh, ratio uh, and the decay constants. And these are for sort of more advanced features where if you don't think that your uh, samples have um, natural um, uh, uranium uh, 235 to, sorry, 238 to 235 ratios, you can actually set the ratio here. And when ILAC like, calculates everything, it'll take those into account. So when we click on crunch data, it'll actually bring up the first um, downhole uh, correction window. So by default, it's well, sorry, it always starts with uh, the lead 206 to uranium 238 um, ratio. And it's broken up to a bunch of parts. So this main part here outlined in orange is the main downhole plot, which I've talked about where it's showing all of your selections and the average of your selections for each time uh, slice and then the fit that it's put through there. Over here, you can set the fit parameters. So you can choose what type of fit you want. So exponential, linear, double exponential, uh, or cubic spline. Uh, you can see all the, um, all the options when, you, when we get to that. Uh, here, you can click on the automatic fit. Uh, so it will automatically try to put the best um, fit to the data that it can. Uh, if you uncheck that, then you can adjust the different um, parameters in this equation here. Generally, I haven't found that you'll get anything better, uh, you won't get a better fit than the automatic fit, uh, unless there's some, some, something strange happening in your data. In most cases, it's better to go and fix whatever that strangeness is, but you can adjust it manually if you want. We also down here have a time resolve plot of the residuals. So uh, this shows the difference between the average, this squiggly red line, and the, the model. So you can see, for example, uh, in this region here, where the average of our time resolved data is higher than the model, that you can see the residuals are slightly positive. And then at this part here, uh, because the average is lower than the model, you can see the residuals are negative. Uh, what this hopes to show you is um, if there's any patterns in your residuals. And, Ideally, you don't want there to be any um, pattern. Uh, ideally, they would be randomly um, distributed um, above and below um, zero. But you know, that's, that's an ideal case. Over here, we have some quality of fit um, uh, indications to try and give you a feel for how your fit is doing. So it has a histogram of the residuals. So this is just a histogram of these results in here. Uh, and this really is, again, just trying to give you a feel for, uh, do you have a skew to positive values or to negative values? And if you do, that means that you may want to adjust uh, what model you're using. Um, also, the same thing up here with the, the, um, some, some 
statistical parameters on the residuals. Excuse me. Um, we've had questions in the past about what is a good fit and what isn't a good fit. Um, like when should you stop trying to increase the, the precision of these numbers? And uh, as we'll talk about in just a little bit, um, it really depends on your setup. So it's very hard to give you actual hard and fast numbers for what, um, what numbers you should be looking for here. You can use these trim settings here. So if you increase this start trim, it means that the model, the data that the model uh, is trying to fit will start to ignore the start data. So if you put one second in here, it'll ignore the first second. If you put three seconds in here, it'll ignore the first three seconds. That can be quite handy if you do have um, some sufficient contamination. Obviously, it's better to avoid that in the first place, but if you do have it, you can actually trim some off. And same thing at the end, if there's some data at the end that you think um, perhaps there's some drill through from one of your analyses and it's messing up your model, then you can get the model to ignore um, those, those last few seconds or how many seconds you type in here. And when you get to the end of the DRS, it'll look like this. So it'll show you the plot for um, your 206, uh, 238 uh, downhole fit and your 207, 235 and your 208, 232, if you've measured those. So let's go back to ILA and let's do that. So hopefully, sorry, PowerPoint is just, let me go, okay. Um, so, uh, so we have our DRS settings. Um, in this case, we can just leave everything as default. So we did use 91500 as our primary reference material. We do have a laser log file. We use, so we use that for both our masking and our beam seconds and everything else we'll leave as default. So when we hit crunch data, as I said, so it's already done the baseline correction and it's now showing us the raw 206, 238 um, uh, downhole um, relationship. And what we can see here is this is the, the fit that it's put through it. And in this case, I think that this could be modeled a little better and this region here could be modeled a little better. So I'm actually going to switch to a smooth cubic spline. So these are the different options up here we have for our, um, for our fits. So, you know, I could try a linear. You can see that's not really improving things down here. Um, I could try, uh, say, a double exponential, but maybe a little better at the start, but we still have these bits here. I'm going to go with a smooth cubic spline in this case. And by default, the, it is maximally smooth uh, for a smoothing value of one. So I'm going to uncheck that automatic fit and I'm just going to decrease it by one or two bits. And you can see that already by that case, it's doing a much better job of going through the center of that. Uh, you can see that our residuals are a little more uh, evenly distributed about zero. And you can see that here in our histogram as well. Perhaps there's a little bit more negative which is probably just these last bits here at the end. But uh, that will do for, for this example. We'll click continue. And uh, it's using an exponential fit for the 207235. And that looks pretty good. And the same for the 208232. So it looks pretty good. So we'll keep clicking continue. Uh, after this ratio, it'll click, uh, it'll have, it'll say finish running this DRS. Let's click that. So now it's calculating the rest of the ratios. And it's giving us this summary here so that uh, we can see the different relationships. Um, you can take a screenshot of this if you want. Uh, over here, we have those histograms saved. And if you click on uh, the, the legend, it'll just show the ones that uh, just show which, whichever one you click on. And if you click somewhere else, it'll show all three again. Um, oh, just one thing that I forgot to mention. Um, so if I want to start again, I click that start over button, then hit crunch again. Um, I can actually hover over um, these and uh, if any particular selection is standing out as quite different, um, I can right click on it and say go to that selection and it'll go take the time series. It will zoom into that selection of the time series. So if we had something that looked quite weird, we could go and have a look at a time series and see if it is actually our reference material or if it's just something that's being mislabeled. Um, or if there's some sort of something else strange going on. So I'll just get back to finishing the DRS. So now if we go back to our time series, we now can see that we have a bunch of our intermediate channels that have been calculated. So the first of those, uh, well, the, the first of those is our beam seconds. 
uh, we have our baseline subtracted values. Uh, we have the first of our ratios and a raw age. So this is our raw ratios and an age calculated from that. Uh, and same with these ratios. Then we have our downhole corrected um, values, our ratios and ages. And then as our outputs, we do have our final ratios and the ages calculated from those final ratios. So it's as simple as that really. Um, I will just mention uh, about the goodness of fit uh, and fit parameters. Sorry, clicked the wrong button. Um, so we found that uh, models are very specific to the cell that you're using. So it really depends a lot on things like your laser wavelength, your gas settings, and, and perhaps other like fluence and, and some other settings there as well. So it can vary quite widely from lab to lab. Uh, other researchers have found that the, the relationship between pit depth and fractionation can change as you go down hole. So it might start off linear and then uh, flatten off to become more exponential. So uh, might be like say an exponential type uh, relationship then becoming linear or some, some combination of effects. So it really depends on how long you measure for. So for the first 60 seconds, it might be linear and then it changes to something else. Um, so what works for the first 60 seconds might not work if you measured, say, for 90 seconds. Um, and uh, also, even with a perfect fit, there's always going to be some noise on the ratio. So that error percentage numbers, those, those goodness of fit parameters in the bottom right, uh, the numbers there will really depend on things like how sensitive your system is, and your dwell times. Uh, so if you're measuring a perfectly flat ratio, there'd still be some noise on that. And how big that noise is really depends on your setup and your mass spec setup. So I guess what this is trying to say is that the, there's no hard and fast values for what is a good fit and what is not. Uh, and it's, it can be lab specific and potentially even session specific, depending on how long you've um, ablated for, what fluence you've used, what gas settings you've used, et cetera. So one really handy thing in uranium lead in iolite is the stacked plot. This is where iolite will take the results for each ablation, not the selection, each ablation, and plot them relative to beam seconds. And this is so that when you look at an individual selection, especially if it's quite noisy, it can be quite hard to tell if there's any trend in those data. But if you stack them all together, and look at the average of those, then you might start to see some trends. Um, in uranium lead, we want to make sure that our downhole data ha doesn't have any more trend in it. We want to make sure that we flattened it properly, um, even with the noise superimposed on that. Um, so uh, we'll have a look at that in just a sec, but it is important to remember that uh, this is this average that we see is affected by the number of selections that are included. Uh, so if you don't have many, then that average might not be as meaningful as if you have more. As always, more samples, more meaningful ages. Um, so let's have a look at that in iLight. So we'll go to tools. Sorry, I've got to stop. PowerPoint. So we'll go to tools and we'll click on the stacked plot. And what we're looking at here is the uh, Plasvice group. Let's actually have a look at tomorrow too first. And what we can see if we go to intermediate and we want to look at the raw ratio. So the raw ratio will be the lead 206. Uh, so this is just looking at 206, 238. You could do the same thing for all the ratios. If we look at that, that's what we saw for our downhole fractionation. So that's that's what we'd expect from the raw ratio. And the average of that is obviously um, meaningless because there's a great big trend through it. Then if we look at the effect, we can look at the effect of the downhole fractionation correction. So if we go to DC 206.23a, this will show us the downhole corrected data. So remember, this ratio is actually wrong, but it's quite flat. That's what we would like to see. We, I mean, it's noisy. And as I said, if you were to look at any individual selection, it might be tricky to tell if that is flat, um, but that does look pretty flat. 
Uh, and then when we look at the final, so you can see that the average of this is about, um, if you don't have the, these ticked on, you can tick them on to show the, the uh, time resolved um, mean and the group stats. Um, so the average of this is uh, around 0.37-ish. Uh, when we go to the final, where it's been normalized to the reference material, see it goes to the, the approximate um, correct value. Uh, so that's, that's what we'd like to see. We'd like to see after the downhole correct, fractionation correction that we, we do see nice flat data. Um, but if we look at Pozovice, just as an example, you can see that there perhaps is, in this experiment, there is perhaps a little bit of uh, trend still in there that's not corrected, or maybe it's over-corrected. Uh, so it does suggest that, in this case at least, that there was a little bit of a mismatch in the downhole fractionation pattern between 91500 and Pozovice. In Tomorrow 2 and 91500 seem to have been paired quite well, but Pozovice might have been a little bit uh, different in this case. In any case, as we'll see, that the final results that we get for Pozovice are pretty good. Um, and so it probably doesn't matter too much. Uh, this is just sort of a very fine scale check, um, but it is something that you, you should be aware of. And we do put it in there just for completeness as well. Um, one of the reasons for that might be that in, uh, if you go to the samples browser, you can see that the spot was only 18 microns for this. And I don't know what the gas settings or the fluence was or the setup for this. Uh, this is just, I think a student did this one in our lab. I just, uh, they shared the data set with me, um, but uh, maybe that has some influence on it. Not to blame somebody else for it. Um, so that's the stacked plot, quite handy. Um, so now that we've got this far, we can actually start to do some QAQC. So we always recommend when we talk about, uh, for anything in iLight, that you should have secondary reference materials because they're such a great independent test of the quality of your data. Uh, without them, you really can't say much about how, how well your process has gone. Uh, in iLight, in the uranium lead stuff, uh, all reference materials are treated unknown except for the primary reference materials. Um, and in this case, in our example, that's 91500. Um, and you can actually run the QAQC. So this means quality assurance and quality control. Um, so you can run these modules uh, on your secondary reference materials to see how they came out. So there's two modules at the moment. Uh, there's the Concordia Age QAQC module, which we'll be looking at in just a sec. And there's the Discordia Age QAQC module. So just to have a look at those in iLight, if we go to the QAQC view here on the left, and we double click on Concordia Age, uh, to start off with, it just shows this little window with nothing plotted in it. We'll just maximize that a little. Actually, that didn't make much difference. Uh, up here in the top left is the settings button. If you click on that, and you choose one of our secondary reference materials. So it has everything in there, but we've only got uh, Plesovice and Tomorrow 2. Uh, so we'll have a look at Plesovice. And what it does is we've got some other options here, but we'll just have a look at what it plots first. So you can see that it plots all of our individual analyses and it plots the weighted mean here in red as well. So in the blue are the individual analyses and the red is the weighted mean. And it also shows us what our measured age is and the accepted age. So in this case, it's done a pretty good job. If we look for tomorrow two at tomorrow two, uh, you can see that it's also done a pretty good job. Uh, we can see that there are individual analyses that might be slightly further off, but it's all pretty, pretty good. We can change it to a Terra Wasserberg plot. Um, and this allowable percentage difference is how far um, this measured weighted mean uh, can be from the accepted age before iLight will flag that there's a problem. So this is especially useful if you're running uh, a processing template where everything's automated and you want the processing template to stop if your secondary reference materials are more than 5% or whatever percent you choose here from their accepted value. So this is a really good way that ILAT will let you know without you having doing anything, it's all completely automated, um, if your results uh, are not what they should be. Um, so I think that's the QAQC stuff. So as I mentioned, you can set the reference material here. Uh, these are the individual analyses. This is the weighted mean. 
it's the measured and accepted age. And at this point, now that we're reasonably confident, you know, like 336 and 33 versus 337, uh, we'd actually be reasonably confident that our data are looking pretty good because our secondary reference materials uh, are quite um, looking quite good. So it's only now that we would actually probably start to go back to our time series and start looking at our individual selections and start working out uh, what we want to uh, select and not select. So um, I'm just going to uh, I don't have that selected. Uh, so it's only now yeah, that we'd actually go and start uh, looking at these. Um, I'm going to hold off talking about adjusting individual sample selections. Uh, Joe's going to show a great way of doing that with the visual age uh, DRS, but let's just pretend at this point that we've gone through and we've selected the parts of our samples that we want to include and we're happy with all of our results. We've had a look in the, uh, in the um, results uh, view and we've plotted everything up. Actually, let's have a look at the Dramona ones. So we've had a look in here and say we double clicked on this and this one looks to be you know, uh, it does seem to be an outlier, but there doesn't seem to be anything particularly wrong with the, with the ablation. Um, so it's, it's got a much higher ratio. Um, we can look at the ages. Um, we can look at the different ages. Uh, same thing, we can hover over anything. Um, at this point, and I mentioned this briefly in the basics webinar, but you, I mentioned that you can have uh, selections that are in more than one group. So everything at the moment, all these samples are in the draw group, but I could also go back again to the tools and the automatic selections and say from channels. And now we have all of these channels and I could actually say, let's select out the channels. Uh, let's uh, select anything less than, um, let's say uh, 400. And it would actually select all of the times where um, where our data, our our ages, our calculated ages um, were less than 400. I'm not saying that you should do this um, uh, as a data selection technique. I'm saying that this is a way where you can break up your results uh, into different selection groups so that they're more easily observable when you um, when you export them. And also just to demonstrate that you can make selections based on channels other than your input channels. You can base them on your output channels if you want. So after you've done all your data interrogation, you're happy with all your selections, you're happy with your ref secondary reference materials, um, then you will look to be exporting your data. And for uranium lead, it's pretty much exactly the same as it is for uh, any other experiment. You will probably want to export your stats. Um, I'd recommend the Excel format. Um, I would include all samples and reference materials and just the output channels. And then in here, we'll probably want to put in um, uh, the mean, two standard error. Uh, in this case, I would probably use uh, propagated, but you can choose to use this one here, which is propagated plus the, um, the reference material uncertainty. I don't think that this has um, any uh, bearing on these ones here. Um, and we'll put in QAQ results and message log, um, which I'll leave in as well. And then we can click um, export. If I wanted to save this as a, as a config, I could click on the little star button here, but let's save that and we'll put that in um, our example files. And you can now click this little open file button here. And this is the file that we've exported. And it's pretty much exactly the same as uh, the others that, we, that we've seen in the um, basics webinar. The only difference is that at the end here, we have these two extra columns and these are the error correlations. So it's error correlation between 206.238 versus 207.235 
and it also has the error correlation for the 207 to 206 versus 238 206. So this is the error correlation you'd use for a typical Cordia plot. This is one that you use for Terry Wasserberg plot. Um, otherwise, everything else in there is pretty much exactly the same as you would see for, say, a trace element um, example. Um, so you can save it that way, and uh, and I'd recommend saving it like that. But you can also use an export script as well. Uh, and relating to uranium lead, we have just released a beta version of the Plasma Age um, uh, uh, preferred output or recommended output. Uh, you can download that from the uh, the GitHub uh, repository. Uh, so this is completely open. You can see everything it does, all the code that it does. It's written in Python. Um, so you, if you want to make improvements to it, um, please do. Um, and then once you've downloaded it, you can select it in this window here in the export script window. Um, and so I've selected that file. And when I click export, it will ask me where I want to save it. We'll save it there as well. I'm going to call this one. Save. And then when we click on open file, it's in this, uh, this format that's recommended by the, the uranium lead community. Um, so it has, has them split up into the data you'd want for a Terra Wasserberg plot, data for a Wetherill plot, then it has the raw dates here, uh, as well as uh, if you've measured 238, 232, uh, and as well as the concordance um, as the last um, channel, as the, as the last column there. And down the bottom, it does have the, um, the settings for the DRS that you used. So that's really handy. As I said, it's open source. Uh, if you want to make improvements to it, um, please do. If you do make improvements, please share it with the community because other people will probably want to see those as well. Um, and you can download that from, uh, so it's, uh, it's on GitHub um, and it's the iLight LASPMS account. And if you look at the iLight for Python examples, um, so before we move on to visual age and, and the more advanced iLight stuff, um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the error propagation, uh, in iLight. This is another thing that we get a lot of questions about and just go over the basics of it. Like I said, we don't have time to go into, excuse me, a huge amount, um, about it. But, uh, if I give you the basics, it'll hopefully give you a starting place to go on. Uh, do some more research on it if you want. Uh, so it's all based on this idea of the MSWD and whether or not, uh, and, and using that as an indicator of uh, whether or not your internal errors, your internal 2SE of each selection is accounting for all of the uncertainty um, that might be uh, affecting your results. And just for those who haven't come across MSWD before, if, you, if your MSWD for a pool of results that's taken from a normally distributed group. Uh, if the MSWD equals one for those groups, it means that the individual uncertainties on each of those um, measurements is about right. If the MSWD is less than one, it means that the uncertainties uh, are overestimated. It means that they're bigger than you'd expect given the distribution of uh, sample results. And if MSWD is greater than one, it means that the uncertainties for each of those measurements is underestimated. So how that looks is if you were to take just a population, uh, a random number of samples from a normally distributed population, you'd expect to see variation in, in that. And each one of those uh, might have some uncertainty in, in this case. Uh, and if the uncertainty is quite large relative to the amount of variation, so I've kind of just by eye uh, drawn a box around that variation, you can see that the MS, sorry, you can see that the error bars are quite large relative to that total variation. So in this case, the MSWD would be less than one. Over here, you can see that the error bars are smaller, and so uh, given the, the variation in the um, in the results, uh, and so you can see that uh, so, sorry, in this case, the MSWD would be greater than one, which means that the individual uncertainties here 
suggest that they're, they're not capturing all the uncertainty. And the way that iLight uses this is to estimate whether or not those internal precisions of each selection are a realistic estimate of the total uncertainty. Uh, so we're looking at the scatter in a, a secondary reference material, um, and it assumes that the reference materials that we're looking at would form a normal distribution. Uh, but what I actually uses, instead of using a secondary reference material, is it uses uh, the primary reference material. And for reasons that are um, partly historical, and uh, there's, there's some theoretical debate over whether or not this is the best uh, approach, but, um, but we'll explain it in this case. Um, so it actually takes out each of the selections from the primary reference material and treats them as if they're an unknown. So it creates this pool of secondary, pseudo-secondary standards. So they're not actually secondary standards, they're pseudo-secondary standards, because it's the primary reference material if you treated each one as, as an unknown. So it takes each out each selection, removes it from the grip, reprocesses everything, and then looks at how far it is from, from the spline. We can't do this for the first or last selection because we start to get unconfined splines. So uh, splines between two selections are normally reasonably well behaved, but beyond that, when it starts to become extrapolation, you can start to get some strange um, effects in the splines. And so to avoid those, we don't use the first or the last selection. So we have to remove two from our pool of pseudo-secondary pseudo standards. So, and to get a decent feel for this MSWD, we need at least 15 selections in this pool of pseudo-secondary selections. So that means you, you need to have measured your primary reference material at least 15 times for this error propagation, about 15 times, um, to get some sort of meaningful propagated error. And it's this, pool of pseudo-secondary standards that we calculate the MSWD. Um, and just so that you're aware, because we're using the primary reference material and the last step of the process is to normalize it to the known value, which flattens all your results. So you can't calculate the MSWD of those because they will always average out that they should basically be the, the value of your standard. So actually do it on the downhole corrected ratios. So we do it uh, on DC206238 for all the ratios downstream from that. And we do it on 207235 for the final two, 207235 and the DC208232 for the final 208232 ratio. So this is another way of showing that uncertainty, sorry, that excess uncertainty so here we have an MSWD of three, which means that these internal uncertainties are too small statistically if, if these group of res results were taken from a normally distributed group, uh, then the, it, this value here suggests that these uncertainties aren't large enough. So what I like will do is it will add some excess uncertainty in portraiture to each one of these until the MSWD equals one. So it does this iteratively. It keeps adding a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more until it comes out as an MSWD of one. And then it can actually see uh, how much excess uncertainty it needs to add. And because it's adding it in quadrature, it'll add uh, a larger, relatively larger amount for the, the, um, the analyses with small uncertainties and smaller amounts for those that have large uncertainties. Now that it knows how much excess uncertainty to add, it adds that as a percentage, or in a relative sense, to all the um, subsequent analyses, so to all the other analyses. So this is how it determines how much excess uncertainty to, to add, and then it applies that to everything else in quadrature as a relative factor. So that's the, the briefest bare bones of, of how it works. Um, and also, I, I didn't mention, but the, this is to account for all your choices in your splining, 
uh, in your downhole fit, uh, in your baseline spine, uh, all those choices may affect um, your final uncertainty. And this error propagation hopes to account for all of that uncertainty rather than just looking at the final, um, the, the final internal uncertainty. So it gives you a bit better estimate of your errors. And it is actually discussed in the Peyton et al. paper from back in 2010. I have one question. Um, so for the ratios, um, the final ratios we know is the average of all the ratios. But for the final age, did you give every point ratio age is an average every age, or did you did you use all um, all the age, all the point average, or ratio mean or mean of ratio? That's, that's my point. Because we found it's not the same as, for example, we use final ratio and use S plot, we gave the age, but different from your age. Yeah, so I think, I think the, the question, if I'm summarizing this correctly, is um, why do you get a different age if you calculate it from the mean ratio to what the, the mean age is that ILIGHT reports? Is that right? Right, yes. Yeah. So this is the, the effect of, uh, it's a, a statistical effect called the ratio of the means versus the mean of the ratios. So, uh, and it's to do with the non-linearity of the age calculation. So if you were to take um, your, I, I'm going to do a blog post on this soon to explain it in more detail. In fact, we might not have enough time to go into it now. Okay, okay. But basically it's, it's that statistical effect and um, I will be, uh, putting up a blog post um, soon uh, describing that and I'll have um, some example data as well to 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 illustrate it so that you can calculate it yourself I'll just do that in in Excel I think I've already started writing it okay so there was uh, just a quick question about laser log files seeing as I've um, uh, I've talked how about how important laser log files are um, and how to work out how to get laser log files running uh, it's in the documentation uh, so it's in the manual, but it's also at uh, highlight.xyz forward slash docs. Um, and that, that should have for each of the, the three major laser manufacturers how to create laser log files. Okay, Joe, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you go. Can you see my screen all right? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, for the remainder, of the webinar, we'll be focusing on the reimagine uh, the Iolite for reimagining of some projects that started several years ago during my PhD. Um, before we get going, maybe we could do a quick show of hands as to how many people here have heard of or used Visual Age in the past. Okay, so I can see a few coming in. Right, so before we get talking about that, um, I wanna talk about this plot here. So what I have plotted is the 206 lead 238 uh, uranium age in red as a function of time and the uranium 238 signal intensity as a function of time in blue. Uh, and this is from one single spot analysis. And you can see that there's quite a lot going on here. So we've got one region here where there's particularly high uranium and an apparently low age. So perhaps this domain has experienced higher degree of radiation damage and has suffered from lead loss. We've got another part that's low uranium and apparently high age. So perhaps here there's less radiogenic lead. Uh, and so it's affected uh, more by a small amount of common lead. And then we have a bunch of other parts that are somewhere in between, uh, but all different. And so the question is what part of this analysis best represents what we originally targeted when we put this spot uh, on a zircon? Um, and it's definitely not clear. So the, the point that I wanna make is that once you move away from analyzing reference materials and start analyzing uh, real samples, things get complicated really fast. And um, I didn't have to look very hard to find this example. This is in fact the first spot from this DRO4 data set. And if we, uh, here's just a couple more examples of how when you're looking at the noisy time resolve signal, it can be hard to tell sometimes which part of the analysis 
is the best to select. And so we've got an example here where the first part yields this pretty nice and concordant uh, bit of data and the later part uh, appears to have some common lead affecting it. And then, so if you were to select the whole analysis, you end up with this discordant point somewhere in the middle. And similarly uh, over here, picking out different age domains that which may or may not, uh, you know, be dubious. Uh, so you have to use your knowledge of the geology, I think, to help guide you a little bit. So when I first started my PhD coming to the earth sciences from a background of uh, physics and computer science. Uh, I was naturally drawn to the laser ablation lab and the associated software. And so uh, after several months of tinkering, uh, we came up with uh, Visual Age, which was our, our stab at, uh, or one, one tool that we came up with to uh, help address this problem of uh, choosing which part of an analysis to use. So originally, uh, Vigil Age was an add-on for iLight 2 and 3, and it was written in Igor Pro's built-in programming language. And it was really separated into two parts. So there was a, a plotting part, uh, which uh, included this live Concordia tool that you can hopefully see uh, animated down here, um, where you could adjust selections in iLight and see it update on a, on a Concordia diagram as you made those adjustments so you could see uh, you know, with the effect of, of choosing different parts of your of your analysis. Uh, and there were some other plotting tools in there as well, but I think that this is the one that most people uh, use. And then the other part was a data reduction scheme. So this was based on iLight's uh, uranium lead geochronology data reduction scheme, but it included uh, additional calculations and corrections. So initially when I made Visual Age, iLight's built-in uranium lead geochronology DRS didn't do uh, 207, 206 age, uh, and it had no common lead corrections and things like that. So these were added uh, for convenience. So what is Visual Age now? So now it's included in iLight 4. Uh, you don't need to go and get any other package. It comes with iLight 4. Uh, and it has most of the popular features intact and I think improved. So the live Concordia, is faster, it has more display options. Uh, you can use multiple windows for different uh, views. Uh, I think all of the calculations from the original have come across. So we have common lead corrections, a variety of common lead corrections, a dose calculation, uh, percent discordance. And all of these calculations, um, the main Visual Age plugin is, is written in C++, but the, the calculation component is uh, written in Python and you can actually see the source code to that. So you can see the Python implementation, how those corrections are done. Uh, you can't modify it per se, but you can look at it and adapt it and, and make your own uh, module to do calculations based off of it. Um, so the things that didn't make the cut um, so far are the static plots that were available. So you, in uh, previous versions of Visual Age, you could do histograms and uh, probability density plots, as well as uh, static Concordia diagrams. So like the non-live updating version, uh, which could include Concordia and Discordia ages. So all of these things uh, can be done with other tools, either uh, outside of iLight or using uh, other functionality within iLight. And it's, it's worth pointing out that when we released this, um, I think just earlier this year, um, we had uh, called it a beta and so that tag uh, remains. And so what that means is that uh, it's working pretty well, uh, but we would like your feedback. So if you're having any problems or if you have suggestions on uh, for ways that we can improve it, uh, please do let us know. Okay, so before we get into looking at a live demonstration, I just wanna familiarize everyone with the different parts uh, of Visual Age and the ways that you uh, interact with it. So everything is initiated through the Visual Age menu, which is in the Tools menu. And these are the items that you will find. So the top one, Live Concordia, will open a new Live Concordia window. And then the majority of the things in the middle are all to do with configuring, running, and clearing calculations. And then the final item is to show uh, the source code, the Python source code for all of those calculations. 
So the way that the calculations work is that you can, you can individually uh, run a calculation, but if you find yourself always doing the same set, uh, you can go into the calculation, uh, the, the, the submenu for the calculation and check this include uh, item. And then when you click the main calculate button up at the top, it will be included in a sort of batch run of all the calculations that you commonly use. And so in these calculation submenus, you, that's where you can also find the options for the corrections. The live Concordia window looks like this. So we have a the main plotting uh, view at the top with the familiar tools from the time series uh, view uh, that we commonly use in iLight. So you've got tools for zooming and panning uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, down at the bottom part, there is an expandable parameters panel that allows you to see the active selections uh, name and comment, as well as some information uh, about the active selection. So the different ages uh, that are coming out of that selection. All of the configuration that you can do of this uh, live Concordia is done via the right click contextual menu. So if you do that, you'll see something like this pop up. Um, the, we'll go through uh, all of this in a bit more uh, detail in a live demonstration. So there's no point dwelling on that, I don't think. Uh, but just to give you a feel for some of the different things uh, that you can do. So you can switch it between a Weatherall or a Tara Wasserberg style plot. Um, this just highlights a little bit of the uh, nomenclature, I suppose. So if you've toggled to show group data, that's these red ellipses here. So it's gonna plot an ellipse for each selection within the active group. Um, the blue ellipse is the active selection of the active group. When a, an ellipse is plotted like this, that's called a whole selected ellipse because there are some different modes for plotting the active selection. Um, and this green crosshair here is the reference data. So if you're working, if you're looking at a uh, selection group that also has reference material data, so in this case, we're looking at Plezo, then it will pull up that data and plot it for you. So you can see how it looks relative to the known value. Um, these are some different modes that you can plot the active selection in. So uh, the blue is that whole ellipse that I already mentioned. And then there are a couple other modes. So there's this, this partitioned ellipses and individual points. So what, what happens there is that the selection is color coded from the dark uh, blue colors uh, at the start of the selection to you, the hotter yellow colors at the end of the selection. And so if you go into partitioned ellipses, it will split up your selection into a, a series of ellipses, uh, color coded by time, which allows you to see what's happening throughout a selection very easily. And the same thing for individual points. So now you're not pooling the data into ellipses at all. These are all just the individual data points um, from that selection, but, which are also color coded by time, allowing you to see if there's something uh, that you should avoid in this selection. So in this case, it's pretty clear that at the end, towards the end of the selection, there must be some common lead. So you would probably want to adjust that selection uh, to the beginning portion. Uh, here are a few examples, uh, just highlighting what you'd wanna see if you were using partitioned ellipses. So uh, on the left, we have an example where all of the uh, sub selections plot on top of each other, which is great. That's what you'd want to see. Uh, we have an example here where we have lead loss occurring apparently uh, with time and another example where you've got some common lead later on in the green. And these are all examples just from this DRO4 data set. There's nothing, I didn't have to look hard to find these. So this is a very common thing that you'll, that you'll see looking at your own data, I imagine. Okay, so now we will, um, look at doing this, doing a demo, live demonstration. So I, to begin with, I'm going to use that same DRO4 uh, session. So if you're trying to follow along, uh, you can continue on with the same session, I imagine. Um, it should have 91500 and Plezo, Tamora, and so on all set up. Uh, and the uranium lead DRS should already be run. Uh, I'm just gonna do that quickly here. How do I? Let's get rid of that. 
So I'm going to set it up from scratch just to uh, show you how fast this can be done. Right, uh, import the log. Now, I always like to have a quick look at the beginning and end and even the middle just to make sure that <clears throat> the synchronization looks good. I guess, as Ben's already pointed out, it should be minus 77.14 seconds, uh, in which it is. So we, we're pretty confident in that. Um, we can also come into the time series view and just make sure that we're happy with everything here. Uh, but I will just very quickly set up the selections using the auto selections button. So coming back to the samples uh, browser, I can click down in the bottom table and click this auto selections button. And it will bring up a window like this, which you should quickly look through to make sure that the sample names are being assigned to uh, correct groups. So in this case, it finds this DRO4C1 and it, it doesn't match any of the reference material groups. So it creates a new group called DRO4C1, but now the rest of the DRO4 uh, samples will match into that group. So that's how that works. And it looks like everything's fine there. I know that there's relatively short uh, uh, durations between the spots. So I'm going to, I'm going to do the baselines automatically here, uh, but I have to use a relatively short reverse trim and, and duration. So I'm only going to go back five seconds from the start of each uh, spot and use a duration of four seconds. And otherwise I think a match cutoff of 0.5 and start trim of one and one should be fine. So now I can just come back to my time series view and double check that everything looks okay. Okay, baseline seems fine. 91 500. I think that you guys would have already discovered that there is one very wonky tomorrow, so I'm just going to delete that right away. Uh, Seems like everything's all right here. So now the next thing to do would be to run the data reduction scheme. So I'm going to come back to the DRS view and click on uranium lead geochronology. And I think for the most part, the defaults here are fine. I'm not going to fuss with the fit here too much because it won't make a difference um, for this demonstration. So I'm just going to click continue, continue, finish. I'm happy with that. Okay, so now we can get started looking at visual age. So for me, I'm just going to plot the 206, 238 age. Of course, you can look at whichever channels you like while you're doing this. Um, I'm gonna bring the, the view in a little bit like that. And I will go to tools, visual age, Live Concordia. So by default, what's happening here is the view is being resized based on the group. And the group has quite a bit of spread in it because of these ones with common lead. So the first thing I'm going to do is change the resize mode from group to be none. And then I can use these tools here to zoom in on just the area that I'm interested in watching. Okay, so the first thing is uh, selecting what you want to look at. So you'll notice that as I change the active selection group here, uh, the data that are being plotted in visual age are changing. So we've got Pleso, Tamara, 91500 will be up here and all the DRO4 data. And then also as you change the active selection by clicking in this list of selections down here, you can see uh, the, the blue ellipse changes as you change that active selection. So I can use the keyboard to scroll through these or the mouse uh, to select different selections here. Now, another thing you can do is select the, or change the active selection right through visual age. So I can see that this Plezo here uh, 
is a bit wonky. So if I right click near the ellipse edge, I can select that one and make it active. And now I could come into the time series view and adjust that selection. So if I start adjusting it, I can see that mm, this one just is a little bit wonky. There's probably not much I can do to make that one better. Okay, so those are a few of the ways that you can select, uh, you can change the active selection and have it reflected in the Visual Age uh, Live Concordia. And you can see that as you adjust and act the active selection, the plot is updated uh, as you make those changes. So now let's look at a few of the different options in this menu here. So as I was saying, you can change it between Wetherill and Terra Wasserberg. So to do that, you would just right click, go to style, and then toggle between the two. Of course, because I have the resize set to none, the view that I'm on here, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, not sure that I, there it is. Now, depending on the type of data that you're looking at, you may find it useful to actually open up more than one of these and that's totally fine. So we can do that. We can have a Terra Wasserberg style plot and a Wetherill style plot. You can also change the different, have unique settings between the two or perhaps on one of them, you're not showing the group data. One of them you are showing the group data. For now, we're, we're just gonna focus on one window, but it, it can be useful to have more than one open. Okay, so we'll change this back to Wetherill, I think. And okay, so we haven't calculated any corrections yet. Uh, so there's nothing for us to do here, but if you have calculated uh, different corrections with Visual Aid, you can toggle on uh, the plotting of that correction for the active selection here. We'll come back to that a little bit later with a different data set. Uh, I suppose now it makes sense to look at these ellipses. So the different ways of plotting the ellipse, as I mentioned, you have three options. So you can do whole, partitioned, or individual points. And you can do all three at once if you choose. So let's see what happens if I put on partition for this. So you can see that it's a bit of a, they, they kind of do all overlap. They just aren't very good. Uh, I think it's more fun to do this looking at DRO4. So I think it's also a bit clear if you turn off the group data. So if I do something like that, and now I start to scroll through these, I'll get a feeling for what's happening in each spot. So there's a couple of good ones, some not so good ones. Uh, I could also turn on uh, individual points uh, if I wanted to see that, or I could take off the partition perhaps. So there's a nice example right there. That's a good one where you can see that as we've a blade into it, uh, we're encountering some common lead. And so if I start to shrink that down, you can just see that everything comes back down towards the Concordia. If I expand it again, the data come back out. And you can see what happens to the entire uh, selection here. So uh, that's also quite handy. Likewise for the partitioned ellipse. So if I did that and I took off whole, you can see that there. And so this is the type of thing that you would probably want to do uh, for your zircon is just come through all the selections and get a feel for what they're doing. And there's one that's really bad. It's not even in the right frame. And as you're doing this, what you can also do is expand this parameters panel down here. And when you find one uh, that's bad, depending on what, you, maybe you would want to just crop this one and keep keep the, the part of the beginning that's that's better. Or perhaps you could write in here a comment to say something like this one has some common lead. And now that comment uh, will be saved with that selection. And when you export your data, you can get that comment and see it. So it would probably be obvious that this has common lead, but uh, you can make other observations uh, as well. Okay, so what else do we have to look at in here? Uh, so 
so there are different, uh, as we, I sort of already mentioned, resize mode. So if you have it set to none, that means when you're changing between selections, the viewport here doesn't change uh, scale at all. If I change it to group, it's going to resize to some frame around the group extents. And if I change it to selection, now we're zooming in right on the on the whole ellipse, which if you're plotting uh, the partition ellipses makes it a bit hard to look at. So I can, if I show the group data, you can get a feeling for where it sits relative to other uh, selections. Okay, we can change the uh, type of error ellipse that's plotted. So we can go uh, 1SE or 2SE and internal or propagated. So if I were to probably change this to none and zoom out so that we can see more of the whole group. If I were to change the error to propagated to SE, you can see, uh, as you'd expect, that they have all gotten a little bit bigger. You can also configure the markers. So you can set the, depending on the age range of the uh, minerals that you're looking at, you may want more dense markers or uh, maybe not as dense markers for some reason. Uh, so to do that, you would just change those parameters here. So I could change this to 50 million years, for example, to get those plotted in. Uh, let's change to Plezo and zoom in on that. And then we can see if we can toggle on this show reference data and that when we do that, then now we get a marker for where the uh, expected composition is for Plezo. Right, so I think that's that's most of the functionality. We can talk just briefly about the items down here. These are more uh, familiar from uh, you know the tools that you that you use uh, in any of the plots in highlight. But uh, so you can toggle on and off the tools. That can be useful if you're on a small uh, screen where you need to make this window really small. Uh, if you've you've got those on then it can cover up a lot of the data so that's you can toggle those on and off if you if you want to uh, the rescale option here will rescale it uh, rescale everything so that includes the Concordia curve um, which you know might not be that helpful or can be really helpful if you're totally lost we also have a couple options here to save the figure uh, and to copy the figure. So if I were to do this, I think this was Plezo. If I save that, I should get a PDF of the plot saved. And similarly, a handy thing you can do with this is if you were to copy that and open up iLight's notes, you can paste that right in. So I uh, should be able to paste that in, yeah. So if I were to go like that, or I could change, uh, suppose I wanted to put in tomorrow as well. I think Alt and click and drag that in as well. And that one was tomorrow. Okay. I think that's everything to do in that menu that I wanted to talk about. Uh, we also talked briefly about the parameters down here. Let me just pull up my slide and make sure we talked about everything. Uh, making a selection active and editing it, the different plotting styles, different plot ways to plot these active selection, error modes, resize modes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, okay. So um, one thing I wanted to show you here was how you could use uh, this code to do something a bit different. So for this particular data set, um, we, we don't have 204 lead measured. It doesn't make a lot of sense to do a 207 lead correction. I know the Anderson correction doesn't really work here. Um, the discordance calculation, because these things are so young, won't really work very well because it's the default is based on the uh, 638 and this 207, 206 age. And because all the noise in the 207, 206 age, it, it gets uh, pretty, pretty scary. Uh, we could calculate the dose. So if we wanted to do that, we could come in, uh, go to dose and click calculate. 
when we do that, now we've got a new channel down here, an output channel called dose. I could plot that. I forget what the units are, uh, but it's quite large as you'd expect. Um, okay, that's that. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you was how you could calculate maybe some different metric of the discordance. And one way we could do that is come down to show source here at the bottom. So when you do that, you'll get a window that looks like this. And so this uh, is the Python code uh, verbatim that's used to do the calculations by Visual Age, but you can't edit this. Um, it's it's read-only, uh, but you can copy the code out of here, uh, modify it, and use that. Uh, so I'll just do a bit of explanation. So each of the or the corrections or calculations uh, generally have a few different functions. So there's uh, for 204, there would be calculate underscore 204 led, a bit of code that does the calculation. And then there's an options underscore 204 led, and that's what's going to uh, the dialog that gives you the options that you can change for that, and then a function to clear any 204 led channels. So what we are going to do is go down towards the bottom and find the, uh, there it is, the discordance calculation. So if I take that and copy it, I can go to the Python workspace and paste that in. Now, Python is quite particular about indentation, so I, I need to remove these spaces here. And if I were just want to change that, uh, so this T76 uh, variable here comes from the final 207, uh, 206 age. If I change that to the 75 age, uh, this will improve significantly for this young data. So I just make that change, click run, it's run. And now if I come back here, I can see that I have a percent discordance channel as well. And that for the most part, uh, things, we've got this plotted as well. That's all right. I'm going to change this to be between minus 200. For the most part, um, the percent discordance is quite close to zero, but then you can see some that are uh, have some degree of discordance. Okay. And you know you could also see that reflected if we were to come in here and so this one, for example, has quite a bit of high discordance, or what's this one? So I could also bring up the hover stats and look at the percent discordance there. And you can see this one that has fairly high percent discordance corresponds to this one here. Um, so that's one thing you could do uh, with the code. All right, coming back now to the presentation. So as I mentioned, you can open more than one Visual Age uh, uh, Live Concordia uh, as well as any of the other uh, uh, little tool plot type things uh, at the same time, if that's helpful. So if you, for example, have analyzed rare earth elements and uranium lead, you could open up the review module uh, and see the Concordia diagram and a normalized rare earth element uh, pattern at the same time. Um, I believe uh, that the version of iLight that you're using may have a bug uh, where if you make the selections very, very short, uh, it'll cause problems. Um, that has since been fixed. Um, so you may encounter that if you're playing around with it. It's to do with the error correlations for very small selections. Um, and I just added this in. Uh, so from last week when we did the first Uranium Lead webinar, uh, somebody had requested that uh, the live Concordia diagram could have uh, the Concordia age or a Discordia age update uh, live. And so since the last webinar, that's already been added. So as I mentioned, if you have some suggestions uh, or problems, please let us know and we will be sure to add them. 
Okay, and one final note about visual age before we move on. Uh, so that is to use it responsibly. So here's an example of uh, Tamora analysis where I've selected this tiny bit of data here and you can see that you kind of almost get a concordant data point that's sort of 70 million years older. And is this, you know, really some older material in Tamora? The answer is likely not. So, you know, use it responsibly. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the visual age U combine or UCPB for short. And now uh, the motivation for that is that it's, it can be hard to find nice concordant reference materials for some minerals. So for zircon, we're relatively lucky, but um, other ones not so lucky, but we, we can find nice discordant arrays. And uh, by that, I mean uh, discordant arrays that are caused due to common lead. Now, we would like to keep working with iLight's time resolve approach to uranium lead so we can do things like downhole elemental fractionation correction uh, and resolving different domains within an analysis. However, uh, variable common lead in a reference material is problematic uh, for the approach that Bentz uh, described earlier. To see why that's a problem, uh, just consider this schematic uh, Terra Wasserberg diagram here. So this is the measured 207-206. Uh, on the Y plotted versus measured 238, 206 on the X. And in the black, we've got the Concordia curve and we have the common lead composition as this red dot here uh, at the Y intercept. We've got the radiogenic lead composition in blue down on the Concordia and we've got some bulk mineral composition somewhere in the middle. Now, if you have varying common lead content, uh, we, uh, many of us probably know that uh, that would cause the data to move along a line uh, like this. However, varying downhole fractionation causes our data to move horizontally along this green line like this. So both processes generate uranium lead variability. Therefore, the early approach, uh, which assumes that all that variability is just from downhole fractionation, will fail. Now we can look at a few different uh, scenarios here. So uh, if we have an individual, uh, if we plot the individual data points from one zircon spot analysis, uh, you might expect it to look something like this, where I have color coded uh, the data by these uh, ablation times. So at the start of ablation, they're the darker colors and towards the end, it's the lighter colors. And typically what you find is something like this, where you start out at high 238, 206, and then as you ablate, that uh, ratio comes down. And you know, just remember that this is the inverse of the ratio that we normally look at in the uranium lead DRS uh, downhole fitting window. So there we typically see the ratio go up, but when you're plotting it this way, it tends to go down with time. Um, so if you had a bunch of data like that and stacked it all up, as we've already seen, the average you get uh, is nice, quite nice, and you can model that and correct for it and everything's great. Now, uh, for the scenario where we've got uh, one spot with common lead now, but no common lead variation. So all the variation is still due to downhole fractionation. In that case, if we have a whole bunch of analyses uh, that you know, produce that same thing, we can just still stack them up in the same sort of outcome would happen. So if all the spots have the same amount of common lead, it's the same as before. However, if we now look at individual data points from several spots with common lead variation between spots, so individual spots are, you know, not varying in common lead for the most part, and in most of the variation is just due to uh, downhole fractionation. What you end up with is a pattern like this, where they're roughly parallel, but all sort of offset from one another. And the average from that uh, is not great and the normal approach will fail. Similarly, if you have common lead variation within spots now, uh, you end up with downhole data that looks like this. And obviously, when you average those together, the, the average that you're trying to model just will not work uh, to represent what's happening with the downhole fractionation trend. So uh, one possible solution are, is to remove the common lead component from the reference material using one of a variety of approaches, uh, leaving only the downhole fractionation to model. So 
the great thing about that is, of course, that it allows us to model that downhole fractionation pattern and correct for it, keeping the data time resolved. And then uh, this also allows for easy calibration of the data as the corrected, the corrected measured values will match what we know about the reference material. So the, I guess, caveats may be that the candidate reference materials must be well characterized, including age and common lead composition. Now, arguably that's true uh, about any reference material, so it's not, I guess, really a, a caveat. Um, and it must only be affected by common lead. Now our, uh, our stab at this was published in uh, 2014 in Chemical Geology, and this was a project uh, that myself and David Chu and Balls Camber uh, had worked on. And so what was this? This was originally, uh, so it was called Visual Age U Combine. It was a data reduction scheme that was written as an add-on for Iolite 2 and 3. Uh, like Visual Age, it was written in Igor Pro's built-in programming language. And it was, it was primarily just a data reduction scheme. There were a few additional functions available to calculate uh, common lead corrections on unknowns as well, I believe. Uh, so now this is included with Iolite 4. Uh, you don't need to go and download anything else. It's, it's built right in. Um, and it has, I think, all of the main features intact and, and somewhat enhanced. Uh, but again, this was something that we released uh, just a few months ago, I think, or maybe even less than that. And it comes with that beta tag. So if you've got some problems or suggestions, please do let us know. All right, so looking at the data reduction scheme settings um, in a bit of details, the, the majority of them uh, are, are shared you know, between most data reduction schemes. Um, the ones that are uh, specific to the, this Visual Age U Combine module are highlighted in blue here. So we'll look at those in a bit more detail. So one is the same as for the uranium lead DRS. So this is just the default uh, fit equation used for the downhole correction. And it can be, as Ben's described, uh, a number of different options. The second item is the common lead correction. So that can be one of none, 204, 207, or 208. Um, we're not really going to talk about the differences between those correction methods, uh, you'd probably want to look into the original papers for more details. Um, the next item is the common lead composition. So this is where to get the, the common lead composition from. So it could be reference material data, or it could be uh, Stacy Kramer's lookup. And that would be based on the age anyways. Um, so either way, you need to have some information in your reference material data that it can base that off of. Now, we also have an option for the a reference for 207, 206 correction. So I think by default, this is going to be none and assume that there's no uh, correction necessary there. Uh, you could use a different reference material. Uh, since, since we're, you know, we're basically saying that the, this, is a, this DRS is applicable to reference materials that uh, have common lead variation, so there would be some variation in the 207, 206. You probably don't want to use that to correct the 207, 206. So uh, this allows you to use a different material there or, or specify a factor uh, specifically to use. So if you were to use a specific factor, that the next item is where you'd put that factor in. And we also have some additional options for what you want to do for uranium isotope selection. So in cases where you've measured 238 and 235, you can have it use just 238 or just 235 or switch between the two at some cutoff. And if you were using some cutoff, you would specify the value here. It's number seven. Now the last item, uh, use selection mean, uh, requires a bit more explanation. So we're gonna look at a little plot here. So if we're using the selection mean, what we're doing, so looking at the plot on the, on the left, so if we're using the selection mean, we're essentially shifting this cluster of data by its mean back to the Concordia. Uh, so this is good when there's no common lead variation within a spot, uh, but like in this example here, if we shifted that back down here, we still have some common lead variation uh, coming from, or we still have some uh, apparent uh, downhole fractionation coming from common lead. So you wouldn't uh, want to use that in this scenario. 
uh, if you're not using the selection mean, what that's doing is it's shifting each, it's correcting each individual point back down to the known 207, 206 value. So this works for either common lead scenario, but there is a certain loss of information uh, that may be uh, uncomfortable. So now all these data points uh, lie perfectly on some value here uh, and you lose some information about what's uh, happening uh, with the uncertainty on it. Okay, and a quick note about reference material data. So as I mentioned, you do need to specify you, your reference material data needs certain information depending on the type of correction uh, you're doing and where you're getting that information from. So if you're using the reference material, uh, if you're, you know, if you're using the from reference material mode for the common lead composition and you're doing one of a 204 or 208 based corrections, then you need these, you know, uh, 204 lead ratios. And if you're doing a 207 based correction, you can specify these 207, 206 uh, common lead composition using either of these formats or any of these formats here. Now, if you were using uh, Stacy Kramer's for the common lead composition, then your reference data needs to specify an age. Okay, so we're going to move on to doing uh, an ex a live example of the UCB, the UCPB DRS. Um, if, if you do want to follow along, you can use the uh, provided appetite uh, CSV and laser log. I am going to go through it pretty quickly, I think. Um, so you can feel free to follow along uh, later as well with the video that we provide. So this, the, the data set includes, I think some pretty well-known appetites. So it has uh, McClure, uh, Ma I think this is Madagascar, Durango, and some unknown. So I'm just gonna start a new session here. Now it is, it is an X series uh, file. So that means that we need to tell it the date format. And I believe it's single month, day, day, year, 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 single hour. So it's a, it's a bit unusual in that. So the single month, single hour seemed to work. I'm just gonna open the appetite CSV. Not worry about that. Import the log. Again, I always like to look and see how this has aligned. Looks fine at the beginning. And in the middle. And the end. And so the, the offset that I get is minus one and a half seconds. That seems pretty good. So I'm just gonna click done. I can also have a quick look in the time series plot to make sure that I'm happy with how things look. It seems, seems like everything's right. So I'm just gonna go ahead and create my selections. I'm gonna do that automatically again. So I'm just gonna to come to the samples browser, click down in the bottom table, click auto selections, and quickly skim through here to make sure that everything is matched up appropriately. Looks fine. Now in this case, I know that I have a lot more time between the analyses, so I'm going to do uh, a longer reverse trim and a longer baseline duration. But other than that, I think all the settings here should be fine. We will of course come and have a look and make sure that they're all fine. Now, I think if I go log, I can see that the baseline looks pretty good. Mad, McClure. Now, I believe iLight 4 already comes with a couple of appetite reference material files that should work. Um, yeah, I think so. So because that's the case, we can also see the splines associated with them. Of course, I'm just looking at total beams, so this is pretty much meaningless for uranium lead data. I don't really care about that spline. And Durango and unknown. And now the first thing we're going to do with this data set is have a look at what happens if we don't use the UCPB approach and just use 
more or less the the basic uh, uranium lead geochronology one. So I am going to come to the U-combined DRS and change the reference material from 91500 to McClure. I can use the laser log for beam seconds and use the laser log for masking. But what I am going to do initially is I'm going to change this common lead correction from 207 lead to be none, just so we can see what happens without using uh, this U combined approach. So changing that to none effectively makes this the same as the uranium lead geochronology DRS. So it may be hard to see these colors, but if you skip around and look at some of these selections, what you'll find is that there are quite a few of them that are entirely above and entirely below the average data, and that's really not what you want to see in your downhole uh, curve fit. But we will just carry on with that uh, and assume that it was fine. So if we were to do that and now come, so say we'll plot. I always like to come to 206, 238. So we'll, we'll plot the 206, 238, and we'll, we'll bring up visual aids just to get an idea of what's happening here. So you can see that looking at the uh, Madagascar appetite uh, calculated this way, that the, the majority of the data are reverse discordant and not clustered or forming any sort of nice array. Uh, so this is, this is pretty much garbage. Um, we can now come back and start over on here. I'm just going to close this for a sec. We'll go start over and we'll change this common lead correction to be 207 lead. And we're not going to bother changing anything else. I think everything else is fine for now. And now in this case, it is still quite noisy. So it's, it, it's a bit hard to appreciate, but I think that as you hover over these different selections, you'll find that the majority of them now overlap the average, which is more like what you want to see. So we'll just click continue, and continue and finish. You, oh, one thing that I wanted to point out is that uh, we don't actually correct uh, in this 207 lead method, we're not correcting the 208 lead at all. So this is still quite uh, wonky on the 208, uh, 232 which is fine at this point. So now we could come back into the time series view and just have a quick look again at that Madagascar. And now we can see that it forms this nice cluster here. Um, but it's a bit hard to tell what the age of that is. Um, so what we're going to do is have a look at this we're using the Discordia Age QAQC module. So for now, we'll close that and we'll come to the QAQC and double click on Discordia Age. And to get this to work, we need to click the settings button up in the upper left corner and set it to be mad. Now, initially, this hasn't been anchored and it's a nice cluster of analyses. So uh, this, of course, gives us an entirely useless uh, measured age. So what we want to do is anchor the common lead composition. And I believe for MAD that it's about 0.87. And we can also change this to be Tara Wasserberg. Uh, and now you can see that the, the measured age uh, is very close to the accepted age. Um, one thing worth pointing out here is that this uh, and this accepted age has an uncertainty uh, of zero million years, which is, is a bit worrying. And the reason for that, I think, is that uh, in the reference material data here, we actually specified the uncertainty as zero. Uh, so if we were to actually put in a valid value there, that would show up in the QAQC module. And this this is much like the Concordia age one that Ben's already sh uh, demonstrated. So you've got all of these selections of the specified group plotted with these blue ellipses. And now we've got the fit to it plotted here uh, with the measured age and accepted age as an annotation. Um, let, let me just bring this up for a sec. Uh, so we've looked at how the downhole fractionation trend changes when correction is none versus 207. We've 
looked at how the calibrated data change in Concordia space when the correction is none versus 207. We've looked at the Discordia ages. Uh, we didn't do it when it was none, but I can assure you that it was not good. Uh, and it's quite good with the 207 correction done. Okay, now we can look at applying a 207 correction to the samples. So we're coming back to visual age. One thing we can do now that makes a little bit more sense to do with this data set is we can actually use some of the, vi the visual age corrections. So if we come to uh, the 207 lead correction, we can go to the options. And we're just going to use uh, this age and use Stacy Kramer's to do this correction. So this is the age of uh, MAD. So I'm just going to say OK to that. And I'm going to come here and I'm going to tell it to calculate. Now this is the part where Benz wonders if I slowed it down on purpose to try to get him to buy me a new computer. So we will have to wait here a second while this little wheel goes around. Okay, but after it's done, we will have a look at how you can visualize that in uh, Visual Age and how you, it's, you know, these corrections that are, that are worked out are channels just like any other channel. So you can uh, export them the same, view them in the results view the same. Okay, so that's pretty much done now. So you, the first thing you'll notice, as I was just saying, is that all of the corrections are just creating new channels. So now we have a series of new channels at the bottom that all have this 207 led dash core in parentheses. So those are all the channels associated with that 207 led correction that we just calculated. So we, we could, you know, plot them just like any other channel here. But what I want to show you is how we can view them in visual age. So if we, I'm going to turn off the group data. We'll select one. We're going to change the resize to be off. Zoom out a bit. And now if I go to corrections in 207, you can see where the 207 led corrected data plot uh, relative to the uncorrected data. And you can, you know, come through and see how that works. You can also, let me see, so. I were to look at something like that. Visible. You can also watch, you know, how it updates live when you're adjusting selections as well. And we could also see what that looks like in here. So all of these channels, again, they're just channels like any other channels. So we can come in here and we can go to the 206, 238. We can look at MAD and we can see that it's very close to what you would expect. Okay, the only other thing that I was going to mention is that you can also clear all these calculations. So if I did clear all, you would see that all those channels are now gone. Uh, and you know, if you're not actually using those channels, it's worth pointing out that, uh, well, maybe it's become less relevant in this day and age with massive hard drives and whatnot, but you know, the fewer channels you keep in your session, the smaller your session file will be is there the bulk of the data is tied up in those channels. So if you're not actually using the channels, it's a good idea to get rid of them, I think. All right. So now uh, let's come back to this presentation. I think that I talked about everything there that I wanted to. Um, so this is just a couple of screenshots uh, showing you the different steps of that example that we've already gone through. Um, this is worth talking about though again. So this is again looking at what happens with no correction versus uh, the 207 correction without using the selection mean. So that's what we just did in the demonstration. And then we have 207 led correction using the selection mean. So um, there's a few things to notice which are a bit hard to tell admittedly from these plots, but uh, I think it was a bit more clear earlier that when you have no correction, uh, some of the selections are entirely below or above where the average uh, is, which is it is not ideal. Uh, as well as this whole, uh, the average being shifted to higher values than the corrected ones. So 
Uh, what you can see going from no correction to the 207 correction without using the selection mean is that the whole uh, average comes down and that now all of the selections more or less overlap the average. And now when we use the selection mean, uh, I would argue this actually looks the best out of all of the cases. Um, it actually looks like there's less noise here um, and still all of the selections overlap with that selection. mean. Okay, this is just highlighting some of the features we already talked about with the Discordia Age uh, QEQC module. And looking at correct uh, results uh, coming from the visual age corrections. And that's about it. So just to finish things off, I wanted to again highlight the help and support options uh, available to you. So uh, we have the documentation available at iLight.xyz slash docs. And it, there, there was a lot of uh, discussion in the chat, I think today about uh, using Python for various things. Uh, and part of the documentation does include uh, the Python API. Now that the documentation of the Python API is a work in progress, I think most of the fundamentals are there and it would should give you an idea of uh, the types of things you can do. So it's worth checking out. The support, of course, so mainly the support email, the, uh, the form, form.ilight.xyz, uh, we're encouraging everyone to go check out as well as the, the notes uh, website. Uh, and now one thing, maybe we'll, I'll get Bents to queue it up, is uh, because we've been talking a lot about the Python stuff is the, is the GitHub uh, repository with Python examples. So that's something else that if you're thinking about using Python to do some, uh, you know, whether it's custom exporting or custom plots or custom processing or, you know, the, the possibilities are endless. Um, if you're thinking about using Python, it's worth having a look through those examples. All right, so now I, I'm pretty much done and we'll transition into questions from you guys. Uh, thanks, Joe. I've, um, I've just brought up that screen, um, the, the website, just to show everyone. So I might unshare you if that's all right. Yeah. So yeah, this is the GitHub repository um, for iLight for Python examples. So there's a bunch of different um, types of examples. Uh, so there's ones that use the Python workspace. There's UI plugins, so you can write your own uh, plugins that will appear in the tools uh, menu. Uh, there's QAQC examples, importers, exporters, and DRSs as well. So um, and if you you can download this entire repo, um, but that uh, Plasmage export um, script is in the export options um, there as well. So yeah, uh, as Joe mentioned, we've got time for some questions. So uh, you can either uh, type them to us or you can unmute your microphone and, uh, and ask us if you'd like. Um, I did have uh, one thing that I wanted to, to show. We had a question about the uh, the final ratio uh, we said was normalized to the value in the reference material. Um, and so for 91500, we should get the exact average uh, in our reference material file. So the, the exact value, if we were to look in the standard file, and if we were to look at um, this ratio here, it's uh, 17917, and we get, one seven nine one eight, and this is pretty close, but depends so, a little bit on the splining. Yeah, so that's what I was going to say. Was it really depends on what spline choice you've chosen, and by spline choice, I don't mean the down hole, uh, not this spline, but this one here. So this uh, auto smoothing will choose whether or not it goes through. Uh, let me just zoom out a little bit. Uh, it chooses whether or not it goes through every single selection or if it if it misses it by a little bit um, and that's that depends on the smoothing amount so if we went with no smoothing it would go through um, every single uh, analysis let's look at something with a bit more variation um, 
Actually, no, we, we have to look at the last one, don't we? Because that's the, uh, that's the, the important one. Um, so yeah, the, the amount of smoothing depends on how much uh, it goes through each one. And if we went with like an extreme amount of smoothing, uh, then it would, oh, this is not really showing up very well at all, but it, that the, whether or not the spine goes through each individual selection uh, determines how close that final, um, that final average will be to the, to the accepted value. So that's why there is some offset between the two. Um, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll probably put up a, a blog post on that too um, to make it a little bit clearer than that, that terrible explanation I've just given there. Uh, yeah, so if you have any other questions, just let us know. Did you purposely try to turn them off from asking questions? With terrible explanations like that, I think it can't help. Uh, I so, think there's an assumption for uh, for juice uh, for the U, uh, U, UCPB like this is a standard can only have common lead can only have common lead but how do we know you know if there's a if this sample or standard has lead loss then we cannot use the the U combine because all the seven right. six region all change but how you know we if we try to direct the develop method is that means we have to do something like a teams first to identify if this has the loss or not or do we can do something like using i heard i heard some people using h h f to kind of like dissolve it to to discard the part has the loss so do you have any ideas that make sure we can make the standards or potential standards only have the loss no only have combat but no that loss well, i think I, that's I think... a very yeah I think in, in part in part it's just finding that needle in a haystack. The one you know, you, people don't generally just go and make reference materials out of anything. They have to find the material that's that satisfies all the criteria of being you know uh, ro robust and fit for purpose. So uh, I think a big part of it is just finding the right material. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Vince. No, yeah, uh, yeah. So people do quite often do uh, chemical. Uh, as in solution analyses um, of these reference materials first to determine, like you said, whether or not the, they have any lead loss or if it all is all just due to common lead variation. Um, I think that's a pretty common um, part of determining whether or not a, a material is suitable to be a reference material. Mm -hmm. We're lucky that we've got John Woodhead um, running our uh, ID um, solution analysis. analysis so. Uh, also, I should point out that this appetite um, example file, I'm pretty, is that the one from our lab, Joe? No, it's it's from here. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, well, we get the same results. That's good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was going to say it's just for uh, training purposes, um, whichever lab it, lab it comes from. I wouldn't use it. I wouldn't publish any of the values from it. <laughs> There's a question in the chat. Uh, what's the prospectus for building counting statistics error propagation into iolite? Um, I think the, and I may be wrong, and Joe and I are going to be spending a little bit of time examining this in more detail, but I'm, I'm reasonably, well, not confident. Confidence is not the right word. Uh, in theory, the external uncertainty the error propagation process should account for that so the the counting statistics will affect the ratios and the ratios uh, and the the internal 2se gets its uncertain it, you know it, the internal 2se is based on the counting stats for each um, isotope going in there uh, but then when you add on to that the, the spline choices and all the rest of it i think that that accounts for all of those what it doesn't do is it doesn't specifically uh, single out this is how much uncertainty you get due to um, counting stats uh, that's something that we'll be looking at in the future I, I of course again the answer would, would be that you just do it uh, with something custom in python 
Yeah, if if you want to <laughs> if you want to suggest something for it and and write it in Python, then by all means, please go ahead. It's it may be worth mentioning as well, and that in IL eight three, except for a few custom versions, you could only one run one data reduction scheme uh, at a time. But in IL eight four, the default behavior is that you can run different data reduction schemes and accumulate all of the channels from them. But that is that does require you to say, so, so for example, you could run the uranium lead geochronology and you could run hafnium isotopes. Uh, you could run your own DRSs if you've written them in, in Python or, or whatever. Uh, the issue with that is you have to be careful if you were to run, say, UCPB and uranium lead geochronology that you're not confusing uh, which channel comes yeah. from which DRS. That's a good point. And there would be a lot of channels that are similar, uh, if not exactly the same name between the two. So you definitely want to be sure which uh, one you're using. It, the name of the data reduction scheme, I believe, is a property of output channels. Uh, you can, can you still see my screen, Joe? Yeah. Yeah. So if you click on the, on the channel, uh, you can see in the metadata which DRS it's come from if you wanted to, to use that as an indicator. And it also tells you where the excess error is associated from as well. Um, I, have a, I have a question. Uh, so previously you have um, visual age, the DRS, and visual age, you combine DRS. I think in LS3, it's a different DRS. Right now, mm -hmm. I think you. I only see Geochrome four and VU uh, HU combined. So did you? Does, it, does this you um, UCPB combine the VU H and the VU HU combined like of L that three? No. So that's that's a bit of the difference here. Is that uh, visual age the visual age uh, corrections that used to be part of the data reduction scheme are now just calculations that are done after the fact and. Uh, by doing that, that means that you can use the visual age corrections on top of the normal uranium lead uh, data reduction scheme or on top of U-Combine uh, or on top of any, uh, you know, custom uranium lead data reduction scheme that you've made. It, it, it doesn't really care uh, where the channels come from as long as there are the final uh, ratios and things that it depends on for its calculations. So uh, it's been separated that way. So it's the vi visual age is no longer... Uh, uh, a data reduction scheme. It's just a set of calculations that run on top of whatever's already there. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. We'll wrap it up there. Thanks to everyone for participating. Um, it's great to get everyone's feedback to know what the questions are that people uh, are dying to know. Um, and we can use those to expand upon on the blog. Um, and yeah, uh, we'll be, there'll be more uh, highlight webinars in the future. The next one will be um, on imaging. We'll announce that um, soon via the mailing list. But uh, hopefully this has been useful. And uh, thanks for participating. And we'll see you again soon in the future. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.